Hey guys, this is Eckhart Slaughter. Hello and welcome to another Star Wars lore video. Today we'll be talking about both canon and legends and examining the fate of the Empire's 25,000 Star Destroyers. Now, I did a deep dive video the other day which looked at the Star Destroyers which were destroyed after Endor, in Legends specifically, but that only tells part of the story. As a brief recap though, in Legends, after Endor, the Empire fractured across the galaxy. And most of the Empire's military losses during this period actually came from infighting, rather than the Rebels and later the New Republic. Endor is sort of a microcosm of this. Death Squadron and the rest of the Star Destroyers, which had been attempting to protect the Death Star, were left leaderless after the destruction of the Executor. Under the leadership of Captain Pelion, they decided to retreat, but afterwards could not come Come to a consensus about next moves. That is because Palpatine desired in the Empire such that it would only answer to him. There was no second in command, there was no Empress or Emperor after him, and there was no line of secession. So, the many powerful voices across the galaxy, which had been kept in line by Palpatine, basically decided to do their own thing, and we have warlords like Zinge, the Teradoc brothers, Artis Kane, and more emerge. Some of them were honestly trying to continue the Empire. Others, like Zinge, however, were more interested in making a state belonging to them. Thus, many of these Imperial subgroups rubbed against each other, resulting in many civil wars which saw the destruction of much of the Empire's navy. It was so bad that the Empire even tried to help the New Republic kill Warlord Zinge. After that point, the New Republic became more powerful and started to win military victories across the galaxy, eventually defeating various warlords, including Thrawn. At that point, we see Operation Shadow Hand, where the Empire again unified under Palpatine. However, that event also brought the Imperial Mutiny, which saw perhaps thousands of ships destroyed as they tore themselves apart under the influence of Darth Sidious, who was attempting to cull the weak from his military. Making matters worse is the fact, of course, that the New Republic repelled the Empire during Operation Shadow Hand. They destroyed Biss, probably hundreds of ships around Biss, and killed many important leaders. The Empire would make various other missteps which would result in large ship losses, including Dala's attack on the Jedi Praxium and the Arinda campaign. Between all of those, many, many ships were lost, but that doesn't tell the whole story. Another major aspect of the Imperial Star Destroyers post Endor career was its introduction into the New Republic. Now, at first, this came as you'd expect. Even at the Battle of Endor, the New Republic stole several Star Destroyers, but they didn't stop there. The Star Destroyer actually became an integral part of the New Republic fleet. Although particularly in its later years, the Star Destroyer was somewhat old, ships honestly weren't often made like it anymore, and it offered an incredible amount of firepower. So whenever possible, the New Republic captured ships, from major battles like that of Coruscant, to increasingly engagements against a single ship. As the Imperial Navy fractured, there were more cases where the New Republic could jump on an unescorted Star Destroyer. Even by a couple of years after Endor, Princess Leia was using a captured Imperial Star Destroyer, the Rebel Dream has her flagship, which is somewhat ironic because that ship, initially named the Tyrant, actually served in Death Squadron and participated at the Battle of Endor, though it was captured afterwards. And it wasn't just the New Republic that was capturing ships during this era. The Hapen Navy, for example, in the courtship of Princess Leia, is said to have dozens of captured Imperial Star Destroyers within their fleet. We also see the Black Fleet, which was captured and used by the Yvathan Duskon League, which had at least 44 ships, most Star Destroyers sized or above. Now, I've done an entire video on the history of the New Republic Navy, so I'm not going to duplicate that here, but suffice it to say that captured Imperial Star Destroyers became a crucial part of the war effort. This was especially early on, before the New Republic had true warships like the MC-90, but even afterwards, Star Destroyer class ships, whether made by the New Republic or captured, anchored the majority of the large fleets across the galaxy. Even by the Yuuzhan Vong War, the first actual engagement by the New Republic against the Yuuzhan Vong was led by a Star Destroyer. It was during this conflict as well that the New Republic began highly modifying and perhaps even creating their own ISDs. We have, for example, the Elagos Akla, which, alongside the Mon Mothma, was an ISD with hidden gravity well projectors. The later Anakin Solo was a very highly modified ship which used long-range turbo lasers, special paint, and a variety of unique features. These are typically referred to, nonetheless, as Imperial Star 
Star Destroyers, so it's unclear to me whether they were modified ships or newly built Star Destroyers. However, we do know that during this time, the Empire, and they had been since Endor, was continually pumping out new Star Destroyers, although their industrial capacity was seriously diminished after Operation Shadowhand and after they left the Deep Core for the Outer Rim. The Empire also eventually shifted production away from Imperial Star Destroyers to newer models like the Turbulent class, which just generally were much, much more efficient. The New Republic did the same, they built ships like the Republic Star Destroyer and the Nebula, generally preferring flexibility as exemplified by the Fifth Fleet. By this point too, the New Republic had transitioned into the Galactic Alliance and it too was still using Star Destroyers within its fleet, and it would be rare for a major battle not to have one on probably either side. And that represents the majority of ISDs, most were destroyed, captured, or refitted into other vessels. We also, however, have the case of the Errant Venture, a Star Destroyer initially captured by the New Republic, but surrendered to smuggler Booster Tarek. It was painted red and operated depending on the circumstances for the New Republic, or as a private casino or marketplace. It seems like by the late Legacy era, however, Star Destroyers, at least of the Imperial variety, had fallen out of use, probably just due to their age, not fitting well within the modern naval doctrines, and the fact that the initial supply was probably probably close to running out. Let's now move on to canon, and without an essential guide to warfare or other major reference book detailing the post-Endor era, there's certainly a lot less to talk about here. We do know that many Star Destroyers were squirreled away by various Imperial factions after Endor. Notably Gallius Rax had thousands of ships hidden in nebulas, some of which later went on to fight and die at the Battle of Jakku, but others which rendezvoused in the unknown regions and went on to form the First Order. Before for Jakku, the New Republic was actually doing a really good job at isolating Star Destroyers and small fleets, hunting them down, destroying them with overwhelming numbers, and by the Battle of Jakku, only a year after Endor, the fleet had really dwindled. Still, a fairly significant portion of the Navy did remain known to some within the New Republic Senate, and although powered by resurgent Star Destroyers, the First Order did still use ISDs in their fleet. But of course, that's not all. We've seen in the promotional material for the Rise of Skywalker that in a dark Empire-esque move, Palpatine as well was building a secret fleet of what appear to be older Imperial One class Star Destroyers only, indicating that the majority of that may have been done before the Battle of Endor. Whether that will initially stand against the First Order, join the First Order, is unclear to me at least. Also worth noting is the New Republic Starhawk program. Starhawks were a New Republic ship made out of captured and disassembled Imperial Star Destroyers. They were cutting edge, very very powerful, and I think make a lot of sense within New Republic naval doctrine. The New Republic didn't have the that many officers and personnel to man their ships, so something inefficient but powerful like a Star Destroyer fell instead to something very expensive but very powerful and efficient like the Starhawk. A trio of these ships was largely responsible for killing one of the Empire's last Super Star Destroyers, the Ravager, at the Battle of Jakku. And that I think is a good history of what happened to the Empire's 25,000 Star Destroyers after the Battle of Endor in both canon and legends. Before I leave though, Jamie has an interesting question about how Star Wars measures time, which he points out would be difficult because all planets would have different orbital periods. And yeah, that's true. I've actually done a whole video on this, but I'll give you the short version. Basically, it would depend on whether a planet was operating in concert with the rest of the New Republic, or Republic or Empire, or whether they were largely independent. For example, for say, a farmer on an outer rim planet, they would certainly measure the time of day based on their planet's rotation and would probably measure years similarly, maybe calling them seasons. However, many planets instead looked to Coruscant for their standard time. Measuring the years would be based off an epoch, like the fall of the Empire, the formation of the Empire, the Rusan Reformation, etc. But you are right in that there would have to be a lot of variability across the galaxy. Anyway, my video dedicated to this topic does a much better job to of explaining that, so I'll link to that in the upper right hand corner. Anyway guys, that's all I have to say. Until next time, have a great day, and may the Force be with you.